Well, why don't you start by just giving us a quick introduction. You don't have to go into the AA stuff. We'll talk about that in a second, but just okay. who you are and maybe uh, how long you've been a part of the church. And um, Susan Beal. I've been a member of Christ Church Albany since hmm, five, six years, maybe. Oh, I don't know about a member. I've been attending five, six years. I've been a member probably four and a half, maybe five. All right. So here's what I want to talk about. So we're in this series right now talking about having these one-on-one -on -one relationships. And my thought, and we'll go into all this, is that uh -huh. I think these relationships are fairly unique. I think that most people know of people, obviously. A lot, most people have acquaintances. They have friends. Uh, some people have even what they would consider to be close friends. But what we're talking about is something that is particularly different. This kind of very we're getting together for the purpose of growth or, you know, all the things we'll talk about here in a right. second. And I think it's pretty unique in our world, but I think there's some parallels. And I think that you can really inform us on what I think is maybe one of the closest parallels to what we're doing as far as a one-on-one. -on -one, and that's the relationships that happen in AA and NA and different other like nine step uh, programs. Uh, so before we get into that, as much as you're willing, can you give us a little bit of your uh, 12 steps? 12 steps. Sorry. I'm, 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 I'm like, I'm, I'm wait a minute, nine, that doesn't sound right. 10? Is it 10? No, 12. Just 12. <laughs> no. my, 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 my apologies. That's <laughs> I, all right. I'm, I'm not trying to short circuit the process. No, I don't believe you are at all. But I couldn't even think of like nine. That doesn't sound right. <laughs> so before we get into what those relationships look like, as much as you're comfortable, can you give us a look at? Can, can I tell your story of being a part of 12 Steps and uh, how yeah. that's affected your life? Yes, I, uh, I have been sober since June of 1998, no, six. I started my job right around the same time. That's why I confused the two. Um, I was in a marriage in California and it was, there was a lot of drugs and alcohol and uh, we separated. I moved back east where my family was from and then figured out that it was not me and him, it was me. Actually, I was uh, watching, babysitting the animals at a pastor from a church I went to at, at um, Del Mar Farm Church. And I was watching her animals while she was on an Alaskan cruise. <clears throat> and I, you know, drank both nights. But the second night, I, I just was like sobbing and, you know, yelling like, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to me? And honestly, I'm getting goosebumps. I feel like God tapped me on the shoulder and said, take a look at yourself. You know what I mean? There is nobody else but you. It's you that has to make a decision, has to make a choice, has to figure out what to do because there is nobody else. Yeah. And then the next day was Sunday and I went to church and that was my first sober day. And I've been sober uh, 24 and a half years since then. Oh, that's amazing. And I know, so, it gives me goosebumps just telling that story. Yeah. So what, what was that like going to your first meeting? Was that a pretty intimidating process? Uh, I would, no, I, you know, because I was a drunk. So, I mean, one day I was drunk every day for like three years. And then the next day I was not drunk. So when I went to meetings, you know, they, right away, the women, um, I don't want to say they personally encircled me, but you know, they, they were helpful and they were like, come across the street and have Chinese food at that Chinese food place and come have a cup of coffee at Dunkin' Donuts. And there's always coffee and there's always cookies and there's always people. They love to try to help the newcomer because the newcomer has no idea. You have no idea what's going to happen. And especially if, you try to do it on your own for a long time before you come to a meeting and then you're like, Oh, 
this must be a cult or something. These people are weird. These people are strange. Everybody's laughing. You know, nobody's crying. I mean, well, those were detox meetings at St. Pete's. So there were some people that were crying. Yeah, I, I, I love it. I, at some point, I want to go to an AA meeting because it just. Yeah, they have open meetings. It, it just sounds to me like what I think church should be like. Except it's in the dark, you know what I mean? It's like in the basement of a church somewhere. <laughs> yeah, there's some churches that do that too, but <laughs> in an Elks lot. So I, right. We have more light there, though in the Elks lot. Yeah, that's, that's true. All right, so, so you have all these people in a AA meeting, but then they try to link you up with an actual sponsor. So uh, what? They don't. Explain that relationship. It's up oh. to you. Oh, okay, so uh, how does that work? Uh, what does a sponsor relationship look like? How do you get into one? Well, see, the thing is, I mean, because nobody wants to ask somebody to be a sponsor and then be denied. And I was denied my first time. And I was, you know, because it's so hard for you to, like, get up enough courage and enough, because you think, like, somebody that knows more can help you, can tell you what to do, can tell you how to do it. And the first girl I asked said no. So then I was like, oh, that's it. I'm, you know, horrified. I'm never going to ask anybody else. But I used to go to these meetings over in this church that's now um, Emmaus. And I, I don't remember who told me, like, or I heard in a meeting, like, if I don't, if you don't have somebody help you, if you don't get a sponsor, you might not be able to, you might not make it. Or I don't remember, maybe I did something or I chaired too long. That's what it was. I was, somebody asked me to chair the meeting at St. Pete's and I went on and on for like 20 minutes and somebody shut me right down. And they were like, get a sponsor. And I was like horrified, you know, cause I had asked the one girl and she said no. So I went back out and looked for this one. So I picked this hardest ass girl. She was so hard, but she was like, all time. She already had 25 years. She didn't hold hands. She didn't hardly smile until you got to know her. And she said, okay, I'll do it. Call me every day. So, oh, you know, I had to call her every day. But, you know, in the beginning, she said, all you have to do is like, say your name. You know, we don't have anything to talk about because you don't know the person yet. And she said stuff to me over and over and over, like, no matter what, you don't have to drink no matter what, you don't have to drink. And I mean, that, you know, that's something I always think no matter what. I mean, not like I really get tempted or not like I really felt like I might, but I mean, I just hear her voice in the back of my head saying, no matter what, you don't have to drink. So. That's good. I don't. Yes, I, yeah, I love that story. I love that. And in fact, that's a, such a great parallel too of the story of you just talking and talking and talking. So I'm like, you just need to get a sponsor. In fact, that's, that's like one of the reasons like, why we oh want no. to get these one-on-ones is that, yeah, I mean, on Sunday morning, I mean, if someone, you know, now with the online world, if people got, if someone got in the chat and just started to like, you know, just sharing their whole life story, you know, people be like, this really isn't like the time and place for this, you know, or, or even if you're in a community group, I mean, there might be some times where, you know, someone's really got something going on and they share for a while on a community yeah. group. But, if one person is just like spending half the community group every single time just talking and talking and talking, it's like that's just not the place for it. And that's one of the reasons why we want everybody to be in a one-on-one -on -one is that, yeah, it gives you that time where you can actually really talk and really be heard and listen to yeah. someone else. And you can do, you can have a much longer dialogue in a one-on-one -on -one than you can or should have in any other environment. That's right. Gotcha. So you guys were getting together in person a couple times a month, but then you were talking on the phone more than that. Yes. Yep. Yes. And because, so like, actually, so the fourth step, she made me do it three times. I mean, the fourth step is like the worst one, you know? Well, it's not the worst one, but it's where you first lay it all out. You know what I mean? And nobody wants to do that. Whoa, whoa, nobody whoa, whoa, wants to whoa. do that. What's the fourth step? Made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. And I wrote it out and then we'd get together and I'd read it and she'd say, do it again. So, you know, I got, you know, and so I even like balked a little bit and I was like, it's too hard because it's like, you know, going in, digging up all kinds of crap that's from your past. What, what, 
what you feel are patterns that make you behave the way you behaved that you were trying to escape from or that you were running away from. But so then, you know, I did it again and she said, do it again. And, you know, the whole point when I was saying it was too hard, it was too hard. She said, okay, then don't do it. When you think it's time for you to do it again, then do it again. And then it will just get to the point where it would feel so uncomfortable for me, whether it was not drinking or whether it was just like still having all this stuff that I did not get rid of yet to share for me. I, I finally just said like, okay, let's do it. You know what I mean? And we went to Washington park and for the third time. And then I, you know, wrote it all out. I still have the notebook upstairs. I haven't looked at it again in 20, 20 years. Cause why would I, <laughs> but you know, so finally she said, cause that's the fifth step when you share it with somebody else. And it, it really was such a relief to get things that I never thought I'd tell another person. I never thought I'd say to another soul, you know, I was afraid if I didn't get everything out, it might make me drink. It might make me not want to be sober. It might make me not want to be successful person. You know, so I just bared it all. I got it all out. Hopefully for the last time. Right. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I think, yeah, and these are such unique relationships. And I think that that right there might be one of the things that's the most unique. In fact, fix all of us, you know, even if we don't drink, we, we all have our things that we keep secret. And there's very few people who really know everything that's going on inside of us. And right. uh, that would be such a scary, but I think important thing for every single one of us to have at least one person that at some point we just, you know, here's, here's <laughs> all. And, and like you said, probably to have someone who's gonna push to be like, nah, I don't think that's it. I think you got more. I think right. there's some more going on there. Right. Try it again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, so our next one is a uh, grow that yeah, I think, especially in church, it's so uh, it's, uh, the opposite of this is kind of accept, which accept sounds so nice. I mean, it's so nice to have someone who I'm sure when you are admitting that you are drunk for someone to accept you and still love you in that process is a really valuable thing. But what your sponsor was doing was not just accepting you like, they were really pushing you to actually get better and to actually, right. you know, see, see, it's a, how important was that? That like, it wasn't just like a, oh, I accept you. I love you no matter what. But that like, she was really like, no, like we're going to, I'm, you're going to help me not drink. I'm going to help you not, not, not right. drink. We're going to, we're going to work on this. How important was that? Just that's, you know, I mean, like I said, she had like 25 years, but they always said, even when a newcomer comes around, it like makes it so, it keeps it green for people. Sometimes you forget like how people have those behaviors or those thoughts that we all had in the beginning, you know? So have you been a sponsor for other people now? I have been, I was a sponsor for a girl in Al-Anon. Okay. Yeah. That's good. So how, you talked about it a little bit already, but obviously you get a lot from your sponsor when you're the, what do they call the person who's underneath the sponsor? Sponsee. Sponsee. When you're the, yeah. Uh, it, same. I mean, do, do you feel like, especially back to like the grow aspect, do you feel like well, the, being a sponsor yourself really helped you to grow by working with that sponsee? Yeah. Well, and it, it's also gratifying because, um, you know, when I, when she used to come over here and we would talk about things and, you know, she uh, had all these behaviors and all these, um, she was very timid and very, um, she didn't speak out loud too much. And she just, anyway, she ended up moving to New Orleans and she would come back and visit me a couple times and she would say things that I never would even imagine would be impactful to her. But, you know, 
and that made me feel good but because all i was trying to do was help her because she like was like having trouble like living life you know i mean she was affected by the season so i mean she would like curl up in the corner of her couch and not want to come out when it was um you know winter so her husband would come over and get me and then i'd go over and you know with, with the lights would be down and <laughs> it was really wild and to see her change from that and it felt very good to see the change in her because of the experiences that we had together so yeah. you so you go to a meeting every day still uh, you know now that it's on zoom i mean i went to Alan on yesterday there's one at 6 45 i do it probably i would say four out of probably five out of seven days do i do a meeting wow so how all i have to do is sit here on my couch like this sure i mean at, the, at this point in your sobriety i mean is it is going to those meetings still super important for your own sobriety or are you there now more to help other people with their sobriety or is it both uh it's it's both because you know if i didn't go to meetings you know i know eventually i would drink if i didn't go to meetings but maybe not for a year maybe i could convince myself after about a year oh maybe i could maybe i could try one beer you know what i mean yeah you can't so but that's the whole thing about meetings it's 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 nice to be able to hear new people it's nice to try to help people but it's also nice to just have it repeated and repeated and repeated and because they always said like so when people came came back in after having gone out and drank again and they always said well thank you and now i don't have to do that because then the people start all over again and you can see and you can even remember i mean you could see like how they shake or when you hear somebody talking and they have three days you remember exactly what that was like i remember what it was like i mean it was just a terrible, terrible time, and I would, I would not want to go back there. Yeah, and so and for me, I mean, as I hear you saying all of this stuff, I mean, it feels like it's so applicable to like any sin that anyone is trying to get over. Like, I feel like anyone who has any kind of an idea in their life that they want to get rid of sin in their life and they want a better fault, like that they need this. Is that? Would you agree with that? Does that sound? Oh yeah, but that's the thing too. I mean for me like it was you know i was going nowhere and i was uh i was not going to be able to be like a normal person on my own if i tried to drink and drug i mean you know i mean it's just that's that's how you get to the point where you go like enough because i tried every enough ways I tried drinking every other day. I tried drinking scotch on the rocks. I tried drinking scotch on water. I tried drinking shitty beer. I tried drinking good beer. You know what I mean? It didn't matter because I didn't want to admit that I could not not drink. And that's the point. I could not not drink. I couldn't put it down. I couldn't stop drinking. And that's the point. So then when you get rid of that and then you see like the whole rest of life i mean i never thought i never wanted to know anything about a goal or something good to look forward to because i was always afraid i would never be able to meet it so i would never set a goal for myself why would i <laughs> you know what i mean yeah. but then i stopped drinking all right well, this has been awesome. Thanks so much for sharing your story and being so honest. And I mean, I'm hoping that through this interview and we'll do some other ones, it encourages people to get into a one on one. But I'm guessing because we're just a church with all kinds of people. So some people might have the, a similar story to yours and are particularly struggling with alcohol. Right. stuff. So I'm I'm happy that you're able to share your story uh, for all of oh, us, yeah. um, but for them and that maybe many people will follow your lead. 
Yeah, and I, I'm happy to, to talk about it because like you said, it's, it doesn't bother me. I mean, I would much rather be able to help anybody that needed help, but now, now maybe they'll have an idea like, oh, maybe I could ask her. Maybe she could tell me how to begin or maybe she knows where I start or any of that, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that's something that I hope is true of our church always, too, is that it's so easy to walk into church when we could walk into church or now probably to log on. And you just assume that I bet most of these people really don't have any like big things in their closet. And I, from, <laughs> from my position as pastor, I mean, I get to talk to you know a lot more people. And so, it, I mean, there's so many people that, you know, either are drunks or used to be drunks or they used to struggle yeah. with this or they're still struggling with this. Yeah. I mean, just, I mean, we're just a church full of a bunch of messed up people. And I feel like right. the more we can share that, it helps people to be able to know that it's okay for them to share their stuff too. But again, we don't want to just like accept that and just be like, you know, Oh, but right. I still love you. We do want to love people anyway. Right. But then maybe yeah, you could find someone to say, Hey, I, I'm going to start getting together with Sue on a regular basis. Cause she could really right. help me actually make some progress finally on this stupid thing. That's right. Or at least, how to begin. Right. Yeah, I love it. All right. This has been great. Thank you so much, Sue. All right. Thanks a lot, John.